Oh, that's a beautiful sight from up here. You know, I wish everybody had to preach one sermon in their life just to stand up here and look at what we get to look at sometimes. People come in, long day, I understand that, plop down, cross their arms, just glare at you like, go ahead, make me smile, make me enjoy church. I dare you to teach me something from the Bible. And here's what I've learned. The great meetings are not meetings where you hear a great sermon. The great meetings are meetings where God's people exhort one another. You know, frankly, there have been a lot of meetings that I was in where I do not remember what the preacher preached. How many of you have ever been in a meeting like that? Come on now. The bad thing is I was preaching in some of them and don't remember what the preacher preached. But you know what I remember? I remember some precious saint of the Lord spoke a good word to my heart. They were the Lord's minister to me. One of your precious people last night, a Phoebe in this church, brought me some of the greatest, some of the greatest pepperoni rolls I've ever had in my life. And Chase and I ate them all the way home last night. That's why he's not here tonight. He about died, you know, he ate so much of it. But I'm telling you, it's what, it's what a fellowship of believers is all about. We don't come to be spectators and sit like knots on a log and say, well, I hope the preacher's got something good for us tonight. No, you come to edify one another and exhort one another and love one another and pray for one another and build up one another. That's the way God designed it. And when that happens, brother, I'm going to tell you, the whole church moves forward because of it. This week, I'm talking to you about church members who make a difference. We're calling the roll, aren't we? And they're not the famous people either. It's not the famous people that always are the faithful people. And it's not the people everybody speaks of first that make often the greatest difference. We, we started on the Lord's Day with old Luke and how Luke, the medical doctor, connected his work to God's work. We got acquainted with Lydia. Everybody remember Lydia? And God opened her heart and opened her house, changed everything. And then we met Aquila and Priscilla. That great married couple serving Jesus together and making a difference for the gospel's sake. Last night, we got acquainted with a lady that's mentioned in only two verses of Scripture, and that is Sister Phoebe. Aren't you looking forward to meeting Sister Phoebe in heaven someday? She'll be there. We're meeting them now on the pages of Holy Scripture, and we will meet them at the nail-pierced feet of Jesus very soon. Tonight, I want to introduce you to two of the Lord's faithful church members who made a difference and I want you to open your Bible with me in the New Testament to the book of Philippians and to the book of Colossians. Now, don't get nervous. Somebody said, heaven help us. He's going to preach both books tonight. We're in trouble. No, we're really just highlighting what the Holy Spirit emphasizes because there's some reason why these people are mentioned in the Word of God. I want you to get your pen out. Everybody got something to mark your Bible with? And I want you to mark these names as they're found in these two beautiful letters. Philippians, of course, the great book of Christian joy, and Colossians, the book of the preeminence of Christ. Uh, to me, Philippians, Philippians and Colossians are two of the most encouraging of Paul's letters. And in these two letters, we find these two lives. Look first to Philippians chapter 2, this beautiful chapter on the mind of Christ. He says in verse 24, But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. Everybody say that name, would you please? Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. Now, this is a man who was a member of the church at Philippi who had come to where Paul was in Rome to minister to him, and now he's being sent back to Philippi to encourage them. He was, he was the Lord's postal delivery boy. That's what he was. Back and forth for the Lord. Come to the end of the book. Look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 17. Not because I desire gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account, but I have all, verse 18, and abound. I am full. Having received of Epaphroditus... There it is again, mark it a second time. The things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Oh, this is really beautiful. Look, Paul opens a care package from the church at Philippi. 
My son is, is at college right now. He just got a care package, a big one from our home church the other day, and he called me so excited about it. Something great when you're away from home, especially when you're in jail, to hear from some people that love you. And he opens the care package, and in the care package are all these things that would minister to his physical needs. And he takes pen in hand under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he writes this wonderful letter to the church at Philippi that we now call the book of Philippians. And Epaphroditus takes that scroll and hightails it back to Philippi, delivering another sort of care package. This is inspired Holy Scripture. I want to tell you, they were good to Paul, but the Lord was especially good to them. And so we're introduced to Epaphroditus. If like in my Bible, you have a little postscript, a footnote at the end of the letter, it says it was written to the Philippians from Rome and it says by Epaphroditus, kind of like the little footnote to Phoebe's life last night. We think she carried the letter to the church at Rome and Epaphroditus carries the letter to the church at Philippi. Now come to the book of Colossians. And we come to verse number six. He's speaking of the gospel and he says to a different church, the gospel has come unto you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day you heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. How many of you are glad you've heard it and known the grace of God in truth? Amen. By the way, look at that verse. Because what's come to you, God wants to go into all the world. God's desire and design is that what we have been the beneficiaries of, we would pass on. We would, not be, we would not be depositories. We would be tributaries, channels through which the gospel would get to the whole world. Then you come to our man. Look at verse 7. As you also learned of Epaphras. Everybody say that name, would you please? Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Very similar situation. That he's, he's come now from the church at Colossae, different man from the church at Colossae, to deliver a message to the Apostle Paul and encourage him. And now he's going to go back and be a blessing to their church. Come to the end of Colossians and look at Colossians chapter 4 and verse number 12 and a long list of names. We have his name again, Epaphras who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Everybody mark that name, would you please, in Colossians 4, verse 11, Epaphras. So, class, stay with me just a minute. In Philippians, there was a man. What was his name? His name was Epaphroditus. In Colossians, there's a man, and his name is what? Epaphras. One more time. Hold your place. Don't lose your spot in Philippians and Colossians. Flip over to the book of Philemon for just a moment, would you please? If you come to the book of Philemon, you'll find that the Apostle Paul references this exact same man yet again. You remember that Colossians and Philemon were parallel letters delivered at the same time. Look at Philemon, verse 23. There, salute thee. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. Twice in the letter to the church at Philippi, we have Epaphroditus, and three times in the letters of Paul to the church at Colossae, we have the name of Epaphras. And for a few moments tonight, I want to talk to you about Epaphras and Epaphroditus. I want you to know that what I'm preaching tonight is not just for knowledge's sake. What I'm preaching tonight is for action's sake because I am convinced these two men were placed on the pages of Holy Scripture to be examples of what every church member ought to be. More and more, Pastor, when I go in and out of churches, I'm grateful. I love seeing people saved as we have this week. Um, but I am I'm less concerned with what people think of the sermons in fact, maybe less than I have ever been because I'm learning something more and more, and it is this. People will hear sermons, like sermons, not like sermons, and they will usually forget sermons. The test of a meeting is not what you think of the messenger. The test of the meeting is, did you become more like Jesus? 
A great meeting is not just a meeting where you have great crowds. We've had great crowds and a great spirit, great spirit, and great singing. Oh, what glorious singing. But that's not what makes the meeting great. What makes the meeting great is when the individuals in the meeting get a hold of the truth and it gets a hold of them and they leave different than they came, determined they're going to make a difference for Jesus Christ. Frankly, for me, the measure of a meeting usually is not in the week of meetings. I most like to hear from pastors several weeks after the meetings. Because I'm going to tell you something, six weeks after a meeting's done, you really know if there was much that happened for the Lord or not. See, I'm not preaching tonight for tonight. I'm preaching tonight for six weeks from now. I, I'm trying to, to simply obey the Holy Spirit and pray that the Holy Ghost of God will blow on it just a little bit and set something in motion tonight that will continue in your life long after this preacher's voice is silent, long after this meeting is a memory, and long after you forgot exactly what my sermon outline was. In fact, I'm on a recruiting mission tonight. And I'm just going to warn you right up front when I finish preaching tonight, I'm going to see how many of God's people will sign up and re-sign, how many will enlist for the first time, and how many will re-engage maybe for the hundredth time because I'm going to tell you what we need. We need some churches like the church in Philippi and the church in Colossae that are getting the gospel of the world, and the only way that's going to happen is if some men like Epaphras and Epaphroditus say, I want to be the church member God wants me to be. People look at churches today so stinking selfishly. What can that church do for me? Let's turn the thing around. What can you do to help make this church everything God wants it to be? That's why people bounce from church to church all the time. They're church hoppers. That probably never happens down here, but in our neck of the woods that happens sometimes. And I'm just going to tell you something. You ought to root yourself in a local New Testament church and give less attention to what everybody else is doing and more attention to what God wants you to do and say, by the grace of God, I'm not drifting with every, every wind of doctrine. I'm not moving every time something new goes on across town or seems a little more exciting than what's going on here. I want to be what God wants me to be, and I want my my church to move forward for Jesus Christ. So the question is, how does that happen? And I want to tell you, it doesn't happen on Paul and Silas. It happens on Epaphras and Epaphroditus. It doesn't happen because of what happens on the platform. It happens because of what happens in the personal life. If the hand of God stays on this church and the good blessings of heaven are poured out in this place for a generation to come on your grandchildren, if Jesus tarries his coming, it will not be simply because you had great meetings at the church house. It will be because God did something in your heart and in your family and you obeyed God. So what do we learn about these two men? By the way, if you're wondering, if you're wondering right now, wonder why he's preaching on both of them. Let me just tell you. May I tell you? Number one, they have the exact same name. Did you know Epaphras and Epaphroditus is the same name? Epaphras is just a contraction of Epaphroditus in that day. It would be like saying Mike and Michael. How many Mikes and Michaels are here tonight? Would you raise your hand, please? So you may get two names, but same name. Dave and David. How many of you are with me? You know what I'm talking about? Bernard and Barney. How many of you are still with me? Yes. This is powerful to me. Here are two men that bear the same name, and they're, 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 they're called a little differently, but it's the exact same name. And not only that, did you know these two men have something else in common? These two men, as far as we know, are the only two men that were specifically sent by their local church as representatives to check on the Apostle Paul when he was in prison in Rome. Now, Paul had other people with him. Luke was with him. Remember that? Timothy was with him. He had lots of other people with him. And he had some who showed up there through the providence of God. They weren't sent there. God just sovereignly got them there. He, he brought some business people there. And he brought some other fellow prisoners along the way. And he brought an old boy by the name of Onesimus who needed to get saved. Oh, he had a lot of people with him while he was in prison in Rome. But there were two men in the New Testament record that were sent, don't miss this, by their local church to be the church representative to check on the preacher that they loved so much. 
Let me ask you a personal question. If this church needed a representative to stand up and represent the work of this church somewhere in this world, would this church look at you and say, that's the kind of man, that's the kind of woman that represents Jesus well and will represent the work of the Lord well? See, we're all ambassadors for Christ. Whether you know it or not, and frankly, whether you like it or not, you do represent Jesus every day, and you do represent the church of which you are a member. You carry more than your own reputation. You carry the testimony of Christ and the church of the living God everywhere that you go. And these two men were good ambassadors for Christ and for his church. So let's look at them. I'll give you three things tonight. Write them down, would you please? Number one, let's look at them together. Epaphras and Epaphroditus. What do we know about them together? Number one, I want you to write down that these were people who were people of ministry. That doesn't mean that they were ministers in the sense that Paul was, but they were in the ministry. Are you in the ministry tonight? Everybody lift your hand and look at me just a minute. Are you in the ministry? Yes, you are. See, the word minister simply means servant, and we are all servants of one master. We're living in a world today where everybody wants to be the the big cheese. Everybody wants to be, be the big man, you know. Everybody wants to be in charge. And I just tell you, there's only one who's really in charge, and that is our God. And the rest of us, we're just bond slaves of Jesus Christ. So before you get too impressed with people, just remember this, only God is great. In fact, let me show you something. Hold your place here. We're coming right back. I want you to run back to Matthew chapter 20 with me for just a moment, would you please? Here's the words of Jesus. See, we're all just followers of Jesus. It might be good if we start seeing ourselves like Jesus sees us again. Look at Matthew chapter 20 and verse number 26. Now let's start in verse 25. And because... James and John's mama had come asking if they could sit on the right hand on the left hand. I always laugh when I see this passage because Jesus called them sons of thunder. Watch this. He called them sons of thunder, and their mama is asking if they can get special privileges. But do you know why? Because Jesus saw them not for what they were. He saw them for what he was going to make them. Now, the rest of the disciples are a lot of sorts about it. They're in indignation, verse 24, against the two brethren. And Jesus called them unto him, verse 25, and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them, but it shall not be so among you. When the church starts operating like the rest of our culture, something is desperately wrong. Look, I don't have to have my way, and you don't have to have your way. Jesus has to have his way. It shall not be so among you. You know one of the things I think is holding back the flood tide of God's blessing this generation? You all know one reason I think we haven't had real revival? Because of our own foolish pride. We're all, all full of ourselves. Too proud to confess our sin, too proud to acknowledge our weakness, too proud to to realize we may not be exactly right about something, just too proud. It shall not be so among you. But whosoever, how many of you like the whosoevers of the Bible? Anybody else like the whosoevers? But we like that. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, here's another one of the whosoevers. Whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Would you mark the word minister in verse 26, verse 27? And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Can you see Jesus girding himself with a towel and getting down on his knees and God taking dirty feet in his hands and washing the feet of those disciples? And Jesus says, this is what greatness looks like. This is what it means to be the chief. It means you become the servant of all. Would you like to know something Epaphras and Epaphroditus had in common? They both were called ministers. They both were were referred to as servants. Now, this is what's really fascinating. 
We write this down somewhere, would you please? I want you to, don't, don't miss what I'm about to say to you. I want you to write down that Epaphras, we believe, was the actual pastor of the church in Colossae. From everything we can gather, matter of fact, look at Colossians chapter 1. He said, he's my dear fellow servant, but he's for you a faithful minister of Christ. We believe that Epaphras was actually the preacher. He was the pastor of the church in Colossae. I mean, he was the guy who was called and commissioned to shepherd the flock. And who is Epaphroditus? If Epaphras was the pastor, Epaphroditus, the best we can tell, was just a regular church member in the church at Philippi. Oh, I love this. You ready for this? God wants to use the preachers and the people. See, this whole clergy laity idea, it's funny. We, we hate it in the Catholic church, but we sure do like it in our own. We fussed about the priesthood and the laity among the Catholics, but I'm going to tell you what we have done. We have given people the idea that you got all the professional Christian workers up here. You know what I mean. They're the ones who get paid to do it. They're the ones that do it for a living. Listen to me. We're not talking about what you do for a living. We're talking about what you do with your life. We're not talking about where you get a paycheck from. We're talking about you being a part of the greatest work on planet Earth, and that is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I came to tell you tonight, God uses the Epaphrases and God uses the Epaphroditus. You have a pastor in this place who's a faithful minister for you. Amen. By the way, don't you ever take that for granted. You ought to thank God every day the Lord's put a shepherd in this flock. Amen. And you ought to pray for him and you ought to pray for his wife and you ought to pray for his children and you ought to pray for his grandchildren. You ought to pray a hedge of protection around him. You ought to pray God would keep him and the devil would stay away. You ought to hold up his arms in prayer every day of your life. But don't you miss this. While you're praying for God to use the preachers, don't miss the fact that God wants to use you. And the ministry works both ways. Both of these men ministered to the congregation and both of these men ministered to the servant of the Lord. You be an encourager of everybody you can possibly encourage. In case you didn't realize it, everybody's having a hard time right now. Every preacher I know right now is fighting the hounds of hell. And every church I'm in, every week, I'm meeting people who are brokenhearted, who say to me at the door with tears, please pray for this. Please pray with me for this. Listen to me. Preachers and people are all fighting the devil right now, and everybody needs a good word that makes the heart glad. You make up your mind. You're going to be one of the edifiers, one of the exhorters, one of the encouragers, one of the equippers of this church. You be an Epaphras and Epaphroditus, and God will use you to minister to many people. So the first thing we know is both of them were ministers. Second thing, write this one down, would you please? Let's go through them in order now. Go back to Philippians. Let's just look at Epaphroditus first. They're both ministers in their own way. But what do we learn from Epaphroditus? I want you to write down that Epaphroditus was a man of sacrifice. We've lost the meaning of that word today. We know very little of sacrifice. We complain over minor inconveniences. We fuss when we don't get our way. I just want to remind you that somewhere in this world tonight, there's a group of people meeting in hushed tones in a room in a small out-of-the-way place with the blinds drawn for fear of being discovered in their worship service. I just want to remind you that somewhere in this world today, somebody died for their faith. I just want to remind you the long time before we ever had the liberties we have, there have been a whole lot of people that served God when it wasn't convenient and it wasn't comfortable and it wasn't easy. This, this weak, lax kind of American Christianity we've come to know is a whole long ways from the Christianity the Lord Jesus introduced to his disciples. People say they'll die for Jesus. Nonsense. We won't die for Jesus. We'll barely even live for Jesus. You know what we need? We need some people to get the heart of Christ again and say, whatever it costs me, I'm going to serve Jesus, I'm going to win souls, and I'm going to be a blessing. I'm going to help our church move forward no matter what anybody says and no matter what the devil does. Now, the church at Philippi had actually sacrificed for Paul. Matter of fact, look at chapter 4 just a minute. Mark the word sacrifice. Epaphroditus brought the things, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. 
In a very real sense, the church of Philippi epitomized sacrifice. Well, Epaphroditus was the man who epitomized the sacrifice. I'll prove it to you. Go back to chapter 2 now. We read verse 25, and it's a great verse, but I don't want to just read verse 25. Keep reading. Verse 25 tells us he's a brother. Sound familiar from last night? He's a family member. How many family members are here tonight? Wave at me just a second, all you family members. Aren't you glad to be in the family of God? All right, so he's a brother. Then he's a companion in labor. <laughs> we got people today, they want to be saved, they just don't want to work at all. I'm not talking about for your salvation, I'm, I'm talking about because you're saved. We're lazy. We're lazy. Excuse me. We're getting spiritually fat and sassy. We've been in so many meetings like this. We take it all in, take it all in, take it all in, take it all. Brother, wasn't it great? And we do nothing with what we've learned. The world's out there going to hell. No wonder Jesus said, pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he sent forth laborers into his harvest. We don't just need companions in the pew. We need companions in labor. Keep reading. You can see more serious and fellow soldier. So now it's not just a common work. Now it's common warfare. If you had noticed, there's a battle going on. Fiery darts from the enemy are coming from every quarter. We need some people to step up, find their place on the front lines, and be good soldiers of Jesus Christ again. My grandpa's generation knew something of sacrifice. The greatest generation marched off to war to take care of our liberty for which we all thank God. And my generation has enjoyed it to the point we have forgotten that somebody paid the ultimate sacrifice for all of that. And what's happened in our country has now happened in our churches. Somebody sacrificed to build this building. Somebody sacrificed to start this church. Somebody sacrificed to give us what we have today. Who's going to sacrifice in our generation? At any moment when a church no longer has to believe God, at any moment when we shifted into neutral and coast across the threshold of glory, we have lost the spirit of sacrifice, the spirit of the pioneer, and we will not move forward for Jesus Christ. Old Vance Havner said, a rut's just a grave with both ends knocked out of it. And we got to get out of the rut and get out of the death and start moving forward. Jesus said the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. That presupposes that we are advancing against the gates of hell. Not just surviving, not just having church. We need some laborers and some soldiers again. Oh, C.T. Studd. Do you know the name C.T. Studd? C.T. Studd, great missionary. A great cricket player in England. Household name. Powerful athlete. And... Uh, got saved, got gloriously saved. God called him to, to serve him, turned two continents upside down for the Lord. He married a girl named Priscilla. They thought she'd tone him down a little bit. She was as crazy for Jesus as he was. She came down the aisle on their wedding day with a banner across her white wedding dress that said, United to do battle for Jesus. That's a woman right there, let me tell you. C.T. Studd wrote a little book. You can find it online. It's free. You can find it and you ought to read it. It's called The Chocolate Soldier. He said, we're not raising good soldiers of Jesus that will endure hardness anymore. We've created a whole army of chocolate soldiers. They look really nice, and they're very sweet, but when the heat gets turned up, they all melt. You know what we need? We need some Epaphroditus again who say, look, let the critics say what they want to. Let the cynics say what they want to. Let the doubters say what they want to. We're going to stand, and we're going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Keep reading, though. He's your messenger, and he that ministered to my wants. Now keep reading, verse 26, for he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that you had heard that he'd been sick. It's a tender man. I love the strength and tenderness in this. Strong enough to stand, tender enough to weep. Some of you need to pray God to give you your tears back. Some of you have lost your tenderness. You know the early days when you wept for sinners and just loved people. If they're not careful, you'll become a sour person. The idealism of youth turns into the cynicism of old age. The only one thing that cuts through all that cynicism, you know what it is? It's the love of God. Ask God to fill you with the love of God. This is a man full of the love of God. Look at verse 27. For indeed, he was sick, nigh to death. I can hear everybody saying, well, bless his heart, he was sick. 
Yeah, he was sick. Keep reading, you'll find out why. God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation. Look at verse 30. Because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death. Mark this phrase, not regarding his life. To supply your lack of service toward me. Sometimes I get worried about some material thing, some little piddly material need. God's taking good care of us. And every time I do, the Holy Ghost wears me out and reminds me of people who've given up everything to follow Jesus. Sometimes traveling all the time, you get tired. You get lonely and weary. And every time, every time, I, I get a little pity party. Now, maybe you don't ever have a pity party, but I hold them every now and then. Every time I do, the Lord brings Don Sisk to my mind. And I can still see that happy warrior with a smile on his face at this late season of life, still moving forward, going to the next church the next week to preach. What has happened to us? How do we get so weak and flabby and flimsy? What's happened to us? Where are the Epaphroditus among us who are willing to sacrifice their time and sacrifice their energy and sacrifice their resources and sacrifice their whole life if need be for the Christ who gave it all for them? Jesus didn't tell you to love him first. He loved you first. We love him because he first loved us. He didn't tell you take your cross first. He took his cross first, and then he said, you take up your cross and follow me. He didn't say give your all first. He gave his all first, and then he says in response to that, we must give our all to him. You know what a revival is? A revival is a season of reconsecration to Christ where young and old, men and women, lay down on the altar before God and say, Dear God, I've been crawling off the altar in some areas, but I'm putting all of it back on the altar now because I want you to have my whole life. Amen. By the way, did you ever notice what chapter he shows up in in Philippians 2? Look at it. In the book of Philippians, he's in chapter 2. What is chapter 2? Look at the first part of the chapter. What is it? It's the mind of Christ. This is powerful. See, I always had in my mind, well, Paul is a great illustration of the mind of Christ. And Paul says, let me give you an illustration of what I've just been instructing you about. Let me tell you about a guy who didn't care about himself and didn't care about his health and didn't care about his prosperity. He only cared about what Jesus wanted. Here's a man with the mind of Christ. You're not going to think like me. I'm not going to think like you. You're not always going to agree with each other. But I'm going to tell you what brings a beautiful unity among the people of God. When we start thinking like Jesus thinks and we have the mind of Christ, what is it? It's a mind of sacrifice. A little over a year ago, one of my most precious friends and dearest fellow laborers on earth was killed in the Middle East. He was a part of every work we did, everything. The books you see have his fingerprints on them. The, the podcast many of you listen to, he helped me start. The web resources, he helped us design all of it. He was my age, four beautiful children. He's with Jesus now. His life snuffed out in a moment by people full of hate. I talked to him about 25 minutes before he saw Jesus. I was in Iowa preaching. He was in the Middle East in a very, very hard place. And we were talking on the phone about a project we were in the middle of, and he was so excited. He was always excited. And we got ready to hang up, and Stephen said to me, Scott, we just got to do more. And little did he know, in 25 minutes, he'd see Jesus. And I cannot get away from his words. He can't do any more now. His labor's done. His fight is done. His work is done. But I'm still here. Yes. You people are here. Amen. How many of you are here? 
If your neighbor didn't raise her hand, would you check on them just for a second? Look, if you're here, there's a reason you're here. Where are the Epaphroditus's that say, I'm all in and I'm all yours. We have just a little time before we see Jesus. Dear God, give us some church members who make a difference in this world. They are ministers. They are people of sacrifice. Now let's go to Epaphras. We'll end with him. What do we know of this man in Colossians? Well, in Colossians 1, we were introduced to him as the preacher. This is really interesting to me. The emphasis that we're left with, the lasting legacy of Epaphras is not his preaching. It's his praying. Go to Colossians chapter 4, would you please? Look at verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you. Man, there's a lot in this verse. Dear Lord, make me an Epaphras. I love this phrase, he's one of you. (laughs) You ought to mark that in your Bible, he's one of you. It ought to mean something to you to be one of you. Matter of fact, can I show you something really interesting? Back up to verse number 9. This exact phrase is used for one other man. You know who it is? Onesimus, the runaway slave who got saved. Oh, this is really, this is beautiful. Onesimus is a dirty, rotten scoundrel who stole and ran away, and he's coming back now, being restored to these people he's run away from. And Paul says, just want to remind you, he's one of you. He didn't used to be, but he really is now. But don't miss this. It's the same phrase that is used for the pastor, Epaphras. Let a bum come in. Let a drunk come in. Let a harlot come in. Let them come to Jesus and have their sins forgiven. And at that moment, they have the same relationship to a holy God that the pastor of the church has and the same access to all of heaven's resources. Oh, it ought to mean something to us to be one of you. He's a servant not of men. Look at it. He's a servant of Christ. He's not doing this for the people. He's doing it for Jesus. If you've got to be motivated, pumped up, primed up, pepped up every week, if you've got to do it because somebody gives you a little religious pep talk or you go to a religious pep rally and get a little stirred up again, you, your motive is off somewhere. You've got to stop doing it for them, stop doing it for you, and start doing it for Jesus if you're going to be a servant of Christ. He salutes you. He's an encourager. But here's the essence of his work. He's a man of prayer. Always. That's a good word. Let's just stop there for a second. Number one, it's faithful prayer. It's always prayer. Jesus said men ought always to pray and not to faint. Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, praying always with all prayer and supplication. I like that word, always. Did you know prayer is the only thing we're told to do in the Bible without ceasing? Now, if I wrote the Bible, how many of you are glad I didn't write the Bible? I'm glad you didn't write it either. If we wrote the Bible, we'd say go to church without ceasing, witness without ceasing, right? We'd make this long list like we always do. You know, we live by list. And the Lord just said, I tell you what, you just live in my presence all the time. Talk to me and Stay on praying ground. Stay in the spirit of prayer. Because watch this. If you stay in constant and conscious contact with God, that will take care of all the rest of it. John Rice used to say all of our failures are prayer failures. Continuing instant in prayer. That doesn't mean you're always on your knees. It doesn't mean your eyes are always closed. I pray a lot driving down the road. That's a really good time to keep your eyes awake. Can I get a witness there? But the reality is you can stay in the spirit of prayer. God didn't want 10 minutes of your morning. God wants your whole day. You know why you come to the throne of grace in the morning? You don't come to the throne of grace in the morning so you can rush out and do what you want to do the rest of the day. You enter into the presence of God in the morning so you can walk with God all day long. This was a man who said, I tell you, this is not the time to let up. It's time to pray. He prayed always. Then, look at the verse again. Always laboring fervently for you in prayers. It's not just faithful prayer. 
It's fervent prayer. Matter of fact, you should mark those two words, laboring fervently. Do you know what they mean? Laboring fervently. The, the wording that the Apostle Paul uses literally is wording for a wrestling match. Wrestling to the point of agony. You ever been in a fight and it hurt? Funny, isn't it? We pray because we want it to feel good. And the Lord says, I'm going to tell you, that's where the battles fought. Maybe that's why we're not seeing many battles won right now. Because we're trying to win the battles talking to each other instead of talking to God. See, your prayers will get more done than your lectures will. You can win the debate and lose the soul. But when you pray, you get more than what you can get done. When you pray, God goes to work. And brother, I'm going to tell you, we need a whole lot more what only God can do right now. When I think of wrestling in agony, laboring fervently, Old Testament example, how about old Jacob wrestling with the angel to the break of day? I will not let you go until you bless me. And we like to... Concentrate on the blessing. Yeah, well, remember, he limped the rest of his life. And the Lord touched him. Mm. And the rest of his days, he hobbled along. Somebody said, poor old Jacob. Don't feel sorry for Jacob. He became Israel. Amen. Look, please. And that little wound was a good wound. You know why? Because that little crippling made him lean on the Lord. He stopped prancing all over town, strutting his way through life and running at his own pace. And every time he halted on his thigh, I mean every time he halted on his thigh, he was leaning on the Lord. You know what he was doing? He was learning. Prayer wasn't just one night. Prayer was a way of life. Prayer is a declaration of dependence on God. It's not an event. It's not an experience. It's not a euphoria. It's not an emotion. Look, please. It is a journey with Jesus. And every day of your life, you lean on the Lord, not on your own understanding. This is what it means to labor fervently in prayer. In the New Testament example, how about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane praying till sweat becomes as great drops of blood. I tell you, no one's ever wrestled to the point of agony like Jesus did. And don't miss this. When you really get on praying ground, you enter in to the work with the Lord Jesus. It is the work of prayer. See, do you understand? Every time we say, our Father, we think we start the prayer. No, you don't. At that moment, you are entering a prayer meeting that is already in progress. Because at this moment, at the throne of God, Jesus is praying for every one of us. Our high priest ever liveth making intercession for you and I. I know what Jesus is doing tonight. He's praying for you, sir. He's praying for you, ma'am. He's praying for you, young person. Robert Murray McShane said, if I could hear Jesus praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a thousand enemies. But the distance makes no difference, he said. He is praying for me. Maybe you can't see him or hear him, but through the eye of faith and the lens of Scripture, know this, Christ is praying for you, and when you begin to labor fervently in prayer for somebody else, you simply join Jesus at the throne of grace. Look at the verse again. Because it's not just faithful prayer and fervent prayer. It's friendship prayer. Look what he prays. He's not praying for himself. He's laboring fervently for you in prayers. You know what I think? I think the highest and deepest level of prayer is intercessory prayer. And we don't do much of it. Listen to yourself pray sometime. And about 90% of our prayers are for our needs and our wants. And then, then we read our list to God like God can't read for himself. And act like we've done the Lord and those people a favor. Where are the intercessors among us? Where are the people who really know how to get a hold of God? Where are the people bombarding heaven for the salvation of sinners? Where are the people burdened for the prodigals? Where are the saints that don't need to be seen? They just want to be heard. Where are the people who, not, who are less concerned about what happens on the platform and more concerned with what happens in the prayer closet. Pray tell me, where are those people? Where are the Epaphrases? 
we were in a meeting. I don't remember where I was. Several months ago, it was a great meeting, and God was blessing. And in the invitation one night, altars are filled, and people are praying. And, and, and you know, people pray differently and have different ways about them, and that's between them and the Lord. I, I, I try not to enter into that. For me, for me, and I like loud praying and crying out to God. For me, oftentimes when I'm most under conviction and most in tune with the Lord, I just have to be quiet and enter in as a holy hush before the Lord. And we were having one of those moments where people were just weeping and praying and folks seeking God. And I heard an old saint over on my left-hand side. And I didn't open my eyes at first. It was a reverent moment. And I heard her begin to cry out to God. And there was no pretense in it. There was no put on. There was no let me show off. There was none of that in it. Oh, I'm going to tell you something. That woman knew how to pray. And I could tell there were some people there that were a little taken back that she was so vocal. And I'm going to tell you something. I stood there and I said, oh, God, give us more people like that. Give us some people who don't care what everybody thinks. Give us some people who know how to get a hold of God again. Where are those people? Where are they? They don't just pray for themselves and have a better Monday. They pray for others. They pray for the needs of others. And what shall we pray, church? Look at the end of verse number 12. Here's a prayer request. You can pray on the authority of the Word of God. You can pray in the will of God when you pray in the Word of God. Here's something you can pray. Whoever and whatever you're praying for, pray that we would stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. When I left Knoxville a few years ago, a precious friend of mine came in my office one day, and some of you heard me tell the story. He shut the door, and he said, I'm, I'm praying a verse in Colossians for you, and he quoted this verse, and I didn't know the verse. Didn't even know the verse. Read it, but I pulled my Bible out, and he said that phrase right there at the end of that verse. He said, I'm praying that for you, Scott. He said, I don't know all the decisions you're facing right now, but he said, the Holy Spirit has just led me as I've prayed for you and put that verse on my heart, and he said, I'm praying it for you every day. All the will of God. I got some people on my heart tonight. How many of you got somebody on your heart? How many of you got something you can't figure out and you can't fix right now? Would you raise your hand? All right, I'm going to tell you how to pray tonight. Oh, God. All the will of God. Somebody I, I love called me before I, right before I came into the meeting tonight with a burden and a trouble. And I could sense it, hear it. They didn't want to unload on me. And I wanted so much to be where that person was. I wanted so much to try to meet that need. But I can't be there. And really, the truth is, even if I was there, I couldn't meet that need. So you know what I did? I just prayed, oh, God, be where I can't be tonight and do what I can't do. This is wonderful. Your prayers can go where you can't go. Your prayers will accomplish what, what nothing else on earth can accomplish. Listen, because when you pray and labor fervently for all the will of God, you know God is working with you in that prayer. I pray it over my children. Regularly, I pray. I, I don't, even, don't even always say full sentences. God knows your heart. Sometimes I just pray, oh, God. Help Isaac and Morgan right now. All the will of God, Lord. Lord, help Lauren and help Grant. All the will of God. Old boy came in a meeting not long ago, and he came to the altar afterwards and sobbing, crying around. The meeting was done. He said, preacher, he said, God really spoke to me. And he said, I came to the altar to pray. And he said, all I could do was cry. He said, do you think God understood that? I said, understood it. He liked it. See, the Spirit of God prays for you with groanings which cannot be uttered. Some of you can't even put in words tonight. Can't even wrap your mind around it. Let me tell you what you do. You ought to get your Bible, get on your knees tonight, put your finger on Colossians 4 and verse number 12 and start praying that you'd stand perfect and complete in, say it with me, church, all the will of God. Amen. One final little thought. Look at verse 13. He said, for I bear him record. That he hath a great zeal for you. That's a heat word and a heart word. Oh, we need some zealous prayers. That's what we need. We like the zealous preachers, but we need some zealous prayers. That's what we need. Interesting little footnote. 
uh, Laodicea in, in the book of Revelation, they were called on to repent zealously. And it was in the same locales where this man was from. Keep reading. Look at verse 13. He said, He has a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. Did you know these three cities? Look at them. Colossae, Laodicea, and Hierapolis were three cities within a 12-mile radius, 12 miles of each other in the Lycus River Valley. Oh, I love this. This man didn't even just pray for his church. You know what he did? He claimed a whole region for God. Here's a man who said, I got a heart for all three of these cities and all the people that live around here, and I'm going to pray that the will of God would be done in every one of these places. You know what turned this town upside down? Now, this church already makes an amazing impact by your, by your sheer number and influence and witness and preaching and faithfulness. You've made an amazing impact for the gospel. But I'm going to tell you what turned the whole thing upside down. You let some of the saints in this church get a burden for a subdivision. You let, them, you let them adopt an apartment complex. You let them take a street for God. You let them take a part of town and say, that's my part of town, and I'm going to pray for that part of town, and I'm going to pray for every house on this street, and I'm going to pray for every sinner in this business to get saved. And you adopt some people to pray and you will see God work in mighty ways. A great preacher of yesteryear died, a man who was quite an orator. His funeral people filed by the casket to tell his grieving widow how much they were going to miss him. And one of them said to her, Oh, we're going to miss your husband's sermons. And she wept and she said, That's not what I'm going to miss. She said, I'm going to miss his prayers. And I've often wondered when I thought of that man, if I died tonight, would anybody say, we're going to miss that man's prayers? Because the greatest contribution you make to this church is not in the offering plate. The greatest contribution you make to the work of God is in prayer. Oh, Lord. Raise up an army of Epaphrases and Epaphroditus, and the church will move forward and sinners will be saved. Our Father, use the word. Use the word to prod us out of our comfort zone and nudge us forward in grace. Spirit of God, move us from our complacency, from our religious routines and religious cliches, to be people of ministry and sacrifice and prayer. Our heads and hearts are bowed before God. How many of you know you're saved and you're still glad about it? Would you raise a hand to God? Are you glad you're saved? I'm happy to see the young man last night who trusted Jesus raise his hand tonight. That thrills me. Praise God, son. You may lower your hands. Is there one among us tonight that would say, Preacher, I'm not sure I'm in the family of God. I, I'm not sure my sins have been forgiven. I'm not positive I'm ready to go to heaven like I am, but I don't want to go to hell. I'm not sure I'm saved. Pray for me. Would you raise your hand in the air with mine? I won't embarrass you. I want to pray for you. You say, that's me, preacher. You're talking to me. Hold it high. Anyone at all. The Holy Spirit speaking to you. You say, I need to be saved. I need to settle it once and for all. Anyone at all. Then best we can tell, we're talking to believers. So unless you're already bowed in prayer at the altar, would you lift your head and look at me, please? The invitation tonight will be eyes wide open for a moment. I understand the whole every head bowed, every eye closed, but I think sometimes we just kind of melt into the crowd and wait for the final amen. And tonight I'm going to ask you before God and man if you'll join me. I'm going to ask you to do something I'm not going to do. I don't mean to be silly. I really, I'm not asking a funny question. How many of you can kneel? I mean by that physically. You can get down get back up again. You know, we take a lot for granted that we can't do it, right? How many of you can physically kneel? Would you raise your hand, please? Then in a moment, in a moment, 
Now, look, don't do it if you don't mean it. But in a moment, if you will say, I want to be an Epaphras and an Epaphroditus, I want to be the Christian God saved me to be and the church member this church needs, and I want to help move God's work forward, I'm going to ask you if you're physically able and God's spoken to you to get on your knees. You can leave your place and join us in this altar. You can get out in the aisle and kneel. You can turn around and make your seat your altar. We're going to make the whole place a place of prayer tonight. But I'm going to ask you if you're physically able to get on your face humbly before God and man. And if you cannot kneel but you can stand out of reverence for God in a moment, like they did in Scripture, either on their face or on their feet, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet in a moment to make your prayer to God. So that all over this room tonight, on our knees, or on our feet, we say to the Lord, I'm all in, Lord, and I'm all yours. Right now, quickly, quietly, would you just leave your place? You say, that's me. God's spoken to me. Whatever you're going to do for the Lord, do it quickly. Find your place of prayer and begin immediately to talk to the holy God of heaven. Oh, Lord. How we need you.